be starting the book of uh, Genesis, and we'll do a little bit of that today. But um, as a preamble to that, I want to talk, because it's in the context of understanding, I think, sort of like understanding what the mystery is and understanding the book of Genesis, there's a, there's a, there's a bigger picture that we need to capture, right? So, you know, you know I guess the question is, why, why is it called the mystery? You know, that this, this, this time period we call right now, this, this dispensation of the grace of God is part of the mystery. And Paul calls this, calls this truth that we have today the mystery. And we know this prophetic stuff that's been revealed, right? You know, and, you know, so Paul says, as I said, you know, Ephesians chapter 3, Paul, which is, I think, the heart of the mystery, which Paul talks about. He says that in verse 3 of Ephesians 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. And he says, I wrote in a few, or a few words, and you, you can read those things. But in verse 5, definition of the mystery, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the spirits that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs in the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So the mystery, this truth for today, that Paul says, I was given by revelation, and now I'm sharing it, and God's revealing it now. Why is it called the mystery? Why was it that God kept it secret? Okay, now revealed it. All right, look at, um, go to uh, Romans 16. Romans 16, just hold your place. Uh, yeah, you don't have to hold your place on Ephesians, we're okay. Romans 16, and then grab, uh, I think it's Acts 3. Acts 3, just, just to say that there's two, different, there's, there's two different bodies of truth here, and um, it's all the Word of God, but something that uh, you should be able, I guess, make sure you, you know, understand why it's called a mystery is a bigger picture, I guess is where I'm going to head to. For Romans 16, verse 25. Paul talking about, you know, this mystery, all right, talking, you know, sharing his truth. He says, now to him, to Jesus Christ, that has power to establish you, to make you established according to what? My gospel. He says, it's my, my good news, right? What the good news that I'm sharing and the preaching of Jesus Christ. And it says, but it qualifies it according to the revelation of the mystery definition, which was kept secret since the world began. So that's when we go back to the book of Genesis, that's when the world began, right? So God kept it secret from that moment in time that we're going to start with in Genesis 1, right? But so, so that, that was kept secret. God kept it secret, but now is made manifest. So it's no longer secret, although most people still don't know, right? So they, they know if they're, a, if they're a believer in Jesus Christ, a true believer in the shed blood of Jesus Christ and are saved by grace, they know something about the mystery, truth, because that's where you find it, okay? You're not going to find that truth, the gospel, for today anywhere else. It's there. It's, an, you know, it's, it's a new truth not revealed in time past. Acts chapter 3, Paul says, you know, again, Paul says that here's the definition of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Look at Paul says, or, or Peter says here in verse um, 19, we'll start right there. Now, Peter is in the process of talking to, in verse 12, ye men of Israel. All right, see verse 12? It says, and when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people. Who are the people standing there? Ye men of Israel. All right, so he's talking to Israel, right? He's talking to uh, folks like that, the leadership and also others. Uh, but down in verse 19, he tells them, repent ye therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That's when their sins will be blotted up as a nation. When Christ comes back as a nation, they'll be refreshed. They'll be, you know, if you, if you, um, this idea is a refresh is sort of like a restart on a computer, all right? You, you know, like, you, know, you ever have problems? What's the first thing you, you know, you, you just restart, turn it off, restart the computer, right? All right, that's, that's, a, that's a, or your phone or something like that. Something weird's happening, you know, something's messed up, restart. Well, it's a refresh, all right? Anyways, verse 20. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which, was, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must re receive until the times of restitution of all things, notice this, which, the, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets, what? Since the world began. So Peter says, the stuff that I'm telling you about Jesus Christ, who's coming, all... You know, all those things. God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy apostles for how long? 
since the world began. So Peter says, the stuff I'm sharing you, God's been revealing since the world began. All right? Go back to Romans 16. Paul says, the mystery God kept secret since the world began. That is mutually exclusive truth. That is, you know, you got a body of truth here that has been spoken about since the world began. And then Paul says, the mystery God kept secret all that period of time since the world began. It's two things, right? So, so, you, so you, the mystery. So why the mystery? Why did God keep it secret from all those prophets for all those folks in time past, right? Why did he keep it a mystery? Why is it called a mystery? Well, is it because he didn't want people to know about it? Because, you know, if you go back, to, go, back, go back to Matthew 13, Matthew 13, there were some mysteries that God didn't want people to know about. Well, this is part of the prophetic stuff, though, right? So Matthew 13, let's uh, go in verse, I think maybe it's 11, if I remember. So the disciples came and, and, and spoke to the Lord Jesus Christ and, and start in verse 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest unto them in what? Parables. parables. Why do you speak unto them in like sort of parallel truth? You don't say it. Okay. What? what? It's right. Yeah. So you didn't. You, it's like you're not saying exactly what it is, but you're saying it along a, a parallel line of truth. And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not given. So he's saying, these mysteries, there's some truth that I want to share, and you know, and others not, all right? But why is Paul called it the mystery, right? Well, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, or 1, we'll start in verse 1, chapter 1, in verse 18. So why is it called a mystery? And, it's, and, and you know, to understand why it's called a mystery, you need to understand angels. You need to understand heaven. You need to understand the devil, right? Because it's a bigger picture. It wasn't a mystery to keep it secret from people, from mankind. It was a secret to keep it, it was, got, it was kept a secret from the adversary. And that's what it says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 18, it says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish what? Foolishness. But unto us which are saved is the power of God. For it is written. So here's some truth that is written. I will destroy the wisdom of what? The wise. And bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the what? Disputer of this world. Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? All right? God's made it foolish, right? And, he, and, and, and it talks about you know, mankind searching after a variety of things here. But down in verse 26, Paul then says, hey, I want to fit something in here. Pay attention. He says this, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many noble, not many, I'm sorry, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Look around, you guys. All right? You don't see you know, Bill Gates. You know, you don't see a lot of wise people. You don't see a lot of mighty people, people that the world defines as this. Not many noble people. There are, but not many, right? But why? Well, because verse 27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the what? The wise, right? And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, by the way, he's talking about the body of Christ. He's talking about us. Okay? Actually, he's talking about all people, mankind. right? And base things of the world and things which are despised. You know, you know, f you know folks don't like Christians. right? But this is somebody above this. Hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, nothing, to bring to not, nothing, things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. You know, none of us are going to get to heaven and say we deserve to be there, right? Nobody deserves salvation of any time period. Grace has always been involved in any action of, of, of uh, righteousness. Abraham was saved how? By faith, all right? And it was grace. Was Abraham a perfect guy? 
Absolutely not. In fact, he was he was a heathen, right? <laughs> he was a he, you know, he was a uh, a false god worshiping a heathen until God stepped in, right? But anyway, he says. But anyways, but then Paul says, he says, but of him, and you know, but of him of God, are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us, God's made unto us wisdom and righteous sanctification and redemption, right? That according as written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. But what it says is that God's going to bring to nothing the things that are. Okay, what are the things that are? Well, Ephesians 2, verse 1, talks about the course of this world, the prince of this world, right? Go back to Ezekiel 28. He's going he's to confound the mighty. He's going to confound the wise. He's going to make the wisdom of this world look foolish. <clears throat> In Ezekiel 28, you have a picture of Satan, the devil, before the fall. You're going to find out that he is wise, he is mighty, and he is noble. All right? Ezekiel 28. If I can find it myself, it'll be great. Okay. Verse 12. Ezekiel 28, verse 12. <clears throat> You'll need to go back to 1 Corinthians here in a minute. But Ezekiel 28, verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him. And, you might, and then you might say, well, who's the king of Tyrus? Well, he's a king. But what he's looking at is the spirit that motivates the king of Tyrus. You know, Paul says in Ephesians 2, the children of disobedience, the spirit that works in them is... Is, is the prince of this, uh, prince the power of the air. He's the spirit that works in them. He's working in this guy too. But what God's doing is taking basically a parallel truth. Here's the king of Tyrus, not a good guy. And here's the driving force. And he's actually going after the guy that's motivating the king of Tyrus. Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You know, and by the way, if you keep on going down through here in verse 14, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Verse 14, sorry. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. He's talking to the devil, Satan. Before he was anointed cherub. He's talking about the Lucifer. All right. But anyways, notice this. Go back to verse uh, 12. At the end of it, it says, Thou sealest up the sum. You're the, you're the bottom line of my creation. Add them all up. Draw a line. You're the sum. You're the best of the best of the best. Lucifer could literally say, there's nobody better than me. You know, we always tell people, there's always somebody better than you. You know, you're good, you're good an athlete, there's somebody better. Guess what? Nobody's better than Lucifer, right? He's the best. He was a sum. He was full of wisdom. It filled him, all right, to overflowing, okay, and perfect in beauty, Okay. Thou hast, and he said, you know, so like, you know, you're, you're wise, right? Okay. And, and by the way, you're mighty in that. You said of some. Thou hast been an Eden in the garden of God. You had special privilege, right? You are, you are, uh, every precious stone was thy covering. I mean, you are, you know, and it talks about a variety of stones here. Uh, it talks about the, uh, he was um, down to the end of it. He said, the workmanship of thy tablets and thy pipes was repaired in thee in the day that thou wast what? created. So he's not a God, he's a created being, right? right? Verse 14, thou art the anointed, the Christ, the Messiah, cherub, that covereth. And I have set thee so, all right? You, had, you are wise, you are noble, you had the highest standing of all, right? He goes on there, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, you had access, you, know, you had privilege. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire, thou was perfect, in the ways that thou, excuse me, in thy ways from the day that thou was created, and then there was a break until iniquity was found in thee. Right? <clears throat> Lucifer was the top. He was the best of the best. He was wise, he was mighty, he was noble. And God, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 says, I'm going to bring to nothing him. He says in Genesis 3.15, Right? In Genesis 3.15, he says that, you know, by the seed of the woman, okay, I'm going to bruise your head. All right? I'm going to, you know, basically he's going to take the foot, put it on his head. Okay? He's going to subdue him, bring him to, lo you know, to nothing. In Isaiah 14, you read, you know, his exalted, well, we're going to look at these later. This exalted sort of, my, his, I will, I will, I will, I will. And when God says, yet, I'm going to bring you down to the size of the pit. You're going to be taken low. You're going to be brought to nothing, right? In the sight of all, right? 
Um, and, you, and you see that picture through the scriptures. But Lucifer here, who now becomes Satan at the moment he sins, verse 16 says, says this, by the multitude of thy merchandise, you, know, that you, you, know, you, are, you had a plan, you are selling a plan. They have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane as something worth, like, you know, garbage. Profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee. I am going to bring you to non-functionality. Destruction does not mean ceasing to exist. Destruction means it's no longer useful, right? It's nothing. You take a car, you go out with a sledgehammer and beat it up, you know, give a whole, you know people, people will pay to do it. And, you know, charge 10 bucks a pop and they'll go out there and beat your car up, okay, and, and bring it so you can't do anything with it. It's just junk, right? It says, I will destroy thee, cover the chair from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty, pride. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground, I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled the sanctuaries, these holy places, by the multitudes of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic, the things that you were doing, the things you were selling, the things that you were, you were preaching. Therefore, when I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee. I'll bring the ashes upon the earth in sight of all them behold thee, and they, shall, and they that know thee among the people shall be astonished, astonished at thee. You're going to go like, it's like, wow, right? Thou shalt be a terror, and thou never shalt thou be, what, anymore. Not cease to exist. You will never be that anymore. Go back to 1 Corinthians. Chapter uh, 1. So God says, look around you guys. Not many wise, not many noble. So what God is doing is literally taking something that Lucifer, Satan, looks at and says, you're nothing. How long do we live? You know, we're frail human beings, right? We're frail. We're, we're, we're made of dirt, right? God has taken something. Did angels made of dirt? We don't know. They're, they're spiritual beings. You know, they're, 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 they're are, they are made in the image of God. They're sons of God, all right? They have, you know, they, do they ever die? You know, do they feel pain? I don't know if they do or not. But I know that they can be stabbed and keep running, okay? Okay. They, you know, the issue is they are, uh, they are, they are God's creation. Apparently they will suffer, so they do feel pain. If the, the bad ones will, right? So they'll feel pain. Uh, but anyways, God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound, to confuse, to bring into sort of, you know, you know, consternation, I guess, right? But he's confound the wise. You know, Lucifer looks at it and goes like, this is nothing, and God's going to take nothing and make the wisdom of the world and Satan look like nothing. Or he's the guy behind it, right? Okay. He's, conf- you know, he's going to take the, the weak things of the world, you know, you know, it says over in the book of Hebrews that Christ was made a little lower than the angels that he might suffer death. Right? We're lower than the angels, right? And he's been given exalted above that now. The base things of the world, what, you know, Lucifer looks at something you scrape off your shoe, right? And he's going to take that and things that he despises, you know. Okay, hath God chosen, yea. I mean, he, God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the path the things that you, you know, I'm going to take stuff that you think is nothing, and I'm going to bring you to nothing. I'm going to bring the things of this world to nothing, right? That no flesh should glory in his presence. Context. Go to chapter 2, right? And so then Paul goes on to say, okay, uh, that, you know, I'm going to focus on something here. In verse 3, so I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in what? The wisdom of men, but in what? The power of God. It's not about us. You know, the arm of flesh shall what? Fail you. I mean, that was the lesson that Israel needed to learn, right? It was, it was, it's about always depending upon God and his power. Verse 6, notice, how be it, we're not speaking the wisdom of this world, how be it, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, talking about mature, 
Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of what? The princes of this world. And then, by the way, def, you know, sort of here's an explanation. That come to not. They're going to come to nothing. The wisdom of this world and the princes of this world. And he's not talking again. He's like the prince of Tyrus. He's not talking about that guy. Right? Even though it's pretty obvious that the princes of this world's wisdom is pretty foolish, at least to us, right? right? But he's talking about the one behind. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. We speak wisdom that God kept secret. Okay? We speak wisdom that he's now revealing. Even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained, declared, you know, pronounced to himself before the world, right? So before the world was created, he pronounced it, and by the way, it has a purpose. It's unto our glory, right? So the base things of the world that Satan thinks are nothing, God's going to glorify, and the things that have glorified themselves, God's going to bring them to nothing, right? And verse 8 says, this hidden wisdom, this mystery, this, this truth that God has not revealed, which none of the princes of this world knew, and since Satan is the prince, the power of the air, right? Which none of the princes of the world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You know, um, any, of the, any of the rulers of Rome or the rulers of Israel would have cared less about what the mystery said. You know, it didn't, you know what, did, what did they think about Paul preaching that message? They didn't like it, but it wasn't because it affected them. They just hate, you know, other than maybe some, you know, peer, you know, peer power issues. You know, if they liked Paul, they didn't like me, something like that. Okay, this is talking about these angelic princes, talking about Satan. Satan didn't know. Why is it a mystery? Well, to keep it from the devil. That's why it's a mystery. That's why it's called the mystery. To keep it, you know, it's, that's the only reason. God kept it secret. It wasn't about keeping it secret from mankind. It wasn't to hurt mankind, other than maybe confused Israel. In fact, it did confuse them back in Paul's day, right? But it was a mystery. It, is, you know, it was called a mystery because God kept it secret from the princes of this world. For had they known it, they would not have done something. They would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And if that would have not happened, where would we have been? Where would have anything been? Where would, where, you know, go back to Romans chapter 3. Because of the cross, because of the, uh, the blood of Christ and what he accomplished there, God was able to stay true to his word and true to the things that he said and the things that he has done. You know, Israel or uh, Satan always questioned how God saw righteousness in Israel. How could he do those things? You know, David said, you know, blessed the man to whom God will not impute sin. He had no explanation for it. The devil didn't either. Okay, the devil, you know, accused over and over again. You know, they're sinners, they're unrighteous, they're whatever, right? And God said, no, they're righteous in my eyes. Well, how? Well, it's because of the cross. And today, it's because of the cross. Now, things are different today since the cross. Things are different in the heavens today than they were before the cross, right? There's still fallen angels there, but their authority has been re-usurped. God, Christ has been given a name which is above every name, right? There's been a restructuring. He hasn't, the Satan, Satan's angels are still there, but there's no longer sort of the, the same activity that was going on before the cross. Romans 3 verse 24 says, uh, well, verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The payment made by Christ Jesus, we are redeemed or justified freely, right? It is, it is uh, without a cause, but it's also without limitation, right? Verse 25, whom God, talk about Jesus Christ, hath set forth to be a propitiation, a fully satisfying sacrifice, mercy seat. Uh, the, word, the Greek word is hysterion. Uh, it's translated elsewhere as mercy street. It's where the, you know, the, you know, the blood was sprinkled, right? Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith, this is the means, in his what? His blood. To declare, 
This is, you know, here's a declaration, you know, his righteousness, that God was righteous for the remission, that, you know, basically the, 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 um, the taking care of the sins that are past through the forbearance of God. The cross made, it, made God just and righteous to take care of the sins of the past. And that's not the past in your life, because when Christ did it, it was all future for us. He's talking about the past in, as in time past. David, Adam, Moses, Jonah. You know, pick, pick, pick a guy or a gal back in the Old Testament that, that uh, the Lord has given righteousness to. God was righteous because of the blood of Christ, and it tells you how. It says through the forbearance of God. Forbearance means an extension of time until a debt is paid. If you forbear something, you are you know, bearing with it. Bearing for, all right? Bear means to carry. So the, the, the load was carried until the debt was paid. If that debt never got paid, God's a liar. God did stuff unjustly. He was not righteous in doing it, right? So God kept it secret. Goes on to say, to declare, here's a second declaration. The first declaration, God was righteous and take care of the sins of the past. You know, so it explains how the apostles could be saved. That, that Matthew, that tax, tax collector guy, you know, that guy, you know, what, you know he's, he's okay. I, I'm not sure about that, but, you know, anyways. Were there any lawyers in there? I don't think, there were no lawyers in the 12, right? Just checking, but anyways. Uh, second declaration, I say, at this time, today, his righteousness, he's righteous, right? That he might be just, God is just, and he's then also the justifier of him which what? Believe in the Jesus. Today, salvation by grace and by you know, God is absolutely righteous to provide it for anyone who believes in Jesus, right? And it's all through, according to verse 25, faith in his blood, right? His faith in his blood. It's the faithfulness of his blood. Christ died. His blood paid for the sins of all mankind, time past, present, future, right? All. Did he pay for any angels' blood, uh, angels sin? No, and that's why when we go back to Genesis 1, you're going to see that's the case, right? You're going to see that there's just, you know, angels sin how many times? Well, they only had to, they've probably sinned many times since that, okay? But they've only had to sin one time. And the angels that are in God's side, camp, how many times have they sinned? Zero times. It's possible, apparently. Right? How do you not sin? Just do what God says. <laughs> okay. It's easier said. We have this old flesh, though, right? You know, angels didn't have an old flesh right, to deal with. We're going to leave it behind. So we're going to be not angels, but we're going to have a similar state in the future in, in that fashion. All right, let's go back to, uh, well, uh, yeah, let's go back to Genesis 1 then. So why is it a mystery? Well, because God needed to keep it secret, not because of mankind, but because of the angelic beings, right? All right, and, and, and we know, and, and, and we have, you know, Satan here, and he's the prince of power of the air. He's got some problems, you know, he's, he's doing some things, right? And God kept it secret, and he had to keep it secret up to the time of the cross, and after the cross, he could reveal it any time he wanted, right? But he picked the time, the proper time, fits in with what he says. You know, God, you know, when God says something, he means it, and, he, and it's true, right? And so when you go back to Daniel chapter 9, you go there and you see the, you know, the whole passage, they're talking about the 70th week of Daniel, you find out exactly where God could do it. You know, after, you know, after the, you know, the, the, the uh, Messiah comes and is, and is cut off, then there's a the 70th week, right? Well, he fit it right where he could do it. Was that an accident? Now, see, Paul says that it was something God planned before the world began. So before this Genesis 1-1, this was God's plan. God was not caught off guard. God was not, God was not in some darkness about what was happening. He knew everything was going to happen. Before he said you know, earth, heaven, created it, spoke it into existence. God already knew what was going to happen, and he already had a plan for how it was going to happen. 
did he cause everything to happen? There's a little, that's a different story, right? You know, I mean, uh, and did he cause everything? Did he cause Lucifer to sin? Just because you see it, just because you know it, doesn't mean you cause it. What's going to happen? Did you cause it? Just because you know, doesn't mean you cause it, right? Causation and knowledge are different. The prophets knew, they spoke ahead, did they cause it? No, so there's a lot of strange theologic, theologic mumbo jumbo garbage that's out there about people dealing with that type of stuff. And it ends up being, you know, God's the author of sin if you do something like that. But anyways, go back to Genesis 1 1. All right, so in the beginning, maybe we can get through day one here. Okay, so in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And what I said before, I, I believe it's a linear issue. So in the beginning, God created heaven. Nice marker, thank you. So God created heaven, all right? I think some time passed, because Job, like we said about last week, Job 38 talks about the angels rejoicing when God created the earth. Well, they'd have to have some context to you know, not have the earth in order to be pretty excited about God, you know, I mean, if God just said, you know, all of it together, in heaven, God created heaven, earth, angels, I mean, heaven, angels, earth, like bang, bang, bang. The angels, why would they rejoice? They rejoice because of God was going to be with them. He's putting a seat of authority in that, on that planet, stuff like that. So heaven, he creates the, uh, the next thing he creates is angels. That's according to Job 38. And then he creates the earth. And I'm going to do it like this. He creates earth because... Now we have Genesis 1, 1. God created the heaven and the earth. This is time passing. By the way, when he created, he created time. So before this, there was just a beginning that's not a beginning. It's just God, all right? God is eternal. He's outside of time. Sort of like, um, uh, I mean, you know, how could God know all the things that are going to happen? Well, since he created time, he can look at it. So for instance, Suppose this is time. God creates it. That means he's bigger than it. He's, he's beyond it, right? So God can do this. I can look at this side. I can look at this side. I can look at it like this because I'm outside it. I'm beyond it, right? God is bigger than that, right? And uh, anyway, so God created angels like him. They're beings of time. They're created in this time. Now, this is... You don't see this in Genesis 1.1, but you see this in, again, Job 38, that he had to do that. And that means that also the angels are doing something. You know, they, you know it's like they're just more like sitting. You know, we're, by the way, we're not going to sit at Jesus' feet for eternity. Right? You, I mean, right now we're working. Right? Those who have died in Christ, they're resting. But when the Lord comes back at the rapture, we're going to get back to work. Okay, okay. So, so those who go in the rapture, you're going to have a short amount of rest. Not that you're going to need it. You're going to have a new body. It doesn't matter. Right? Those that have gone on, maybe somebody in Paul's day. Paul died 2,000 years ago, but ish. Right? He's been resting, you know, just waiting. Waiting for the Lord to get on with what he plans to do. Right? But anyway, so God created heaven and the earth. So then what happens? All right? So that, that was last week. So then in, in verse, it says, and, and again, like I said, I, uh, I believe something happened in Genesis 1, 2, which is a judgment. And the earth was out form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. If we were to you know, read, well, this, you know, if you have a Schofield, he has this reference here, not that I agree with everything Schofield says, but this is one. Go to Jeremiah 24, or sorry, Jeremiah 4. This phrase, this, you know, there's the, I wouldn't have to go back to Genesis 4 in that I know that God doesn't create darkness and, and, and things like that. But in the context of what Paul says, there's this angelic host, and, you know, God kept the secret since the beginning of the world. Um, and he kept the secret from the devil, so I got, the devil has to sin in here somewhere. Jeremiah 4, verse 23, okay, there's a statement that says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. And the heavens, and the heavens, and the heavens, and they had no light. That's 
you know, verse 2, right? I beheld the mountains, and though they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heaven were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof, thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. The idea is the idea is of judgment. There's a, there's a, you know, that, that, that phrasing deals with judgment. Some people, you know, that's where they hang their hat on it, and other people attack it and say that's, you know, God sort of started with this sort of blob and you know, made something from it, right? Um, I think God creates, you know, the thing, when I look at what God is, when, God, when we look at things in creation, God creates the thing. He doesn't create something that becomes a thing. Right? Things reproduce after their kind. It wasn't like, you know, we started here and we worked on up. I mean, I think you leave room for evolution if you want, if you do that. Not that I, you know, if that was true, I guess we should, you know, should be okay with it. It's not true, but de-evolution works, okay, and go the other direction. That's what man's been doing. We started in the garden and we're heading backwards, right? But, uh, you know, change, adaptation, those are different things. That's not evolution. Anyways, the, the, the earth was without form and void. Darkness upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. There was a big change that happened right there, okay? Because the universe changed, right? Um, what, what happened at this point is there was a judgment, right? There was some sort of judgment. And, and what you find, I read Ezekiel 28. You had this, you know, Lucifer. He was in a lot of, you know, he was in all kinds of places. And then... He was selling a, a message, all right? And then God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I'm, you're judged. What's Matthew 25, verse 41 say about hell? Yeah, for the devil and his angels, right? Okay. God, you know, God created it for them. That was an act of creation, right? When did that happen? Right. Well, either it happened here or it was here and God just didn't show it until there, right? When he created the earth, right? You know, the, those things like that. Cause, cause, and, and if he created for the devil and his angels, that means the devil and his angels did something stupid, right? And it had to happen before he showed up in the garden and talked to Eve, right? So, that, you know, that, so it happens very early in the life of, of time anyways here. Uh, so go to, uh, yeah, we, oh, I got a couple minutes. Go to Hebrew, go book of Hebrews, book of Hebrews. So I'm going to draw a picture for you, which I think uh, will help you understand Genesis 1. But I'm going to go to the book of Hebrews to, to get the picture. All right. So in, in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, says, And now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. Here's what, you know, add up the first eight chap seven chapters. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So here's, talk about Jesus Christ sitting on the right hand of God. And he is a minister of the sanctuary and of the what? True tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man, right? The, com the comparison is there was another tabernacle pitched by man, right? And they're talking about the tabernacle in the wilderness. And it goes on to say this. Down in verse... Um, uh, eight, five, well, verse 4 says, for, for if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve, talking about the man on earth, who serve under the example and the shadow of heavenly things. Right? So there is, there is a true tabernacle, a dwelling place for God, pitched by God, that is, you know, that... that that the tabernacle on the earth is the shadow of, right? Now, does the shadow look exactly like the object? No, it's sort of two-dimensional, right? But you, some, you can see an outline of it, right? Okay. Go over to Hebrews 9. You have a repetition. It says, it says sort of similar thing. In verse 23... Verse 23, It was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifice than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. All right? So anyways, the thing, so the tabernacle in the wilderness is a shadow of the true tabernacle the Lord pitched. So, so anyway, so what I would say is at this point in time, something changed, all right? Right, 
Because before this time, you had heaven and earth, all right? And now you have a new situation. <clears throat> and a new situation is, I'll just, oh, just break here again. We're going to continue. These continue, but then there's another place, all right? There's another place, and this other place is where God's at, all right? God the Father, is up here. we're going to call this you know, the third heaven at this point in time. The third heaven. Here comes heaven where... The angels are at, okay, and earth, which is also, I guess, where angels are at until God creates man, right? And this looks like this. God, when there's this judgment, he creates a containment for the problem. And that containment's our universe, right? Before there was just heaven and earth, right? And now this problem has caused God to create a box. The tabernacle in the wilderness was a rectangle. That's why I'm doing a rectangle, right? Okay, that's the shadow. So I'm going to make it this box, this rectangular box. But, but notice this. We're going to read it now in verse 2 again. And the earth was out of form and void. Okay, there's some sort of judgment going on under there. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. <clears throat> and I'm going to call this box the deep, which consists of heaven and earth, all right? Okay, and, and so darkness is upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So God himself is on the face of this, so he's outside it, so he's out here, all right? I've got to put him out here, right? He's outside, he's upon it, and this deep is in darkness, and there's water, Right? It's in darkness and water. Darkness indicates God's not there. Right? God's not there. He's out of there. But the, you know, so the Spirit of God is moving upon the face of it. He's on the outside of it. Why? Why is God the Father, God, God himself, outside this box? Why isn't with his creation, angels? Well, the, he, what? What? He's light, he's righteous, he's holy. God, you know, can sin be in the presence of God? So God stopped, put a box around the sin. There's the sin problem, right? He's outside, okay? And he begins then focusing, looking at the inside. They're in darkness, right? They're in, there's no light, God's not there. And the water is a symbol of judgment, all right? Like Noah's flood, all right? There's an issue of water. Let me just, uh, we won't get any further than this today, but go to, um, go to uh, Jude, book of Jude. I just thought we should talk about this real quick here. So in Jude, and Peter talks about it too, but I think it's in 2 Peter. Notice something about angels. If you understand the book of Genesis, I think you need to understand angels, and since... We're related to a heavenly program. You sh we should know some things about angels as well. So in Genesis, or Jude chapter, oh, look, just Jude, okay, uh, verse, uh, uh, starting verse 6, okay. Notice the issue of angels and darkness, all right? And the angels, and this, I believe this is Genesis chapter 6. This is me. Some people don't, but. So this is talking about something that happened in Genesis, or, uh, Genesis 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. So there are some angels that have already been prejudged. In fact, you saw that if you read the Gospels, you know, Christ is coming along and there's some demon-possessed person. And they say, are you here to judge us before the time? You know why they ask that question? Because they know some of their buddies were judged before the time. There is a time coming, right? And the angels who kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under what? Darkness and the judgment of the great day. And you can understand the type of sin that they did when you compare it to verse 7, all right, uh, and, and those things. Go over a sec, uh, for 2 Peter 2, verse 4. So a comparative passage. 2 Peter 2, uh, verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that what? Sin. Not all the angels are in this judgment, okay? But cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment 
and spare not the old world and compared it to that period of time right so darkness basically chains up angels all right they get locked down can you by the way can you function in absolute darkness not well at all right you can't you can't do much right and god steps outside it's in absolute darkness darkness is you know and by the way that's what satan's called the prince you know the, he's we're, we've been delivered from the power of darkness right that's talking about satan's program but anyways but anyways there is a group of angels that sin and are judged in darkness go to um revelation book of revelation let's take a look at water water and angels and let me see if i can find it uh, i think it's revelation six no revelation nine revelation nine and verse um, 13. Right? So there's another group of angels that were prejudged, right? Revelation 9, verse 13. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. You're in the middle of the tribulation, right? Actually, real close to the middle, middle. Saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound where? in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed and they did a whole bunch of terrible stuff, right? There are four angels that are bound. Are they God's angels? Well, you know, why would God bind his angels, right? They're bound in the great river Euphrates. Water, you know, angel, angels don't handle water well, okay? So you wouldn't handle being bound in water either, right? I mean, you, you, you would drown, right? Anyways, darkness and water angelic creation the problem is in this creation is that one god wants his you know his you know he wants to continue having a creation with him he could have wiped all the angels out and started fresh right problem not all the angels sinned right go back to genesis 1 we'll finish with this then i'll just briefly go through it So God's moving upon the face of the water as he's in there and this universe is filled with water and it's filled with darkness. And what he wants to do on day one is basically you know, sing the song, who is on the Lord's side. That's what the issue is. Take a look at it, Genesis 1.1. And God said, let there be light. And there was light, okay? He sort of shined his light into the universe. And God saw the light that it was what? It's, you know, it was good. The light was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Did he create day and night here? What defines day and night? That's, yeah, that's, you know, well, yeah. I mean, it's the earth rotating and the sun. You know, there's no sun yet. The sun's not created until day four. All right? Okay, so, you know, that, that's, you know, and, and, and how we count time is sort of divided at that point, but God's already put it in play. God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and notice that it's capital D, day, okay? There's a day, and then he called the darkness what? Night, capital N, night. And by the way, at the end of that day, it doesn't say it was good. And the evening and the morning were the first day, all right? Because night. So what's, what's he doing? Uh, I think that God's looking into the universe, and he's dividing his angels from Satan's angels. And he says, these are of the day. They're good. They're light. By the way, what does God say about us? We are children of the light, right? We are not of the night. We are of the day. First Thessalonians chapter 5, right? We are, we are part of God's light program. We've been delivered from the power of darkness. At this point in time, day one, God separates them. These are mine these are yours. Revelation 12, verse 6 and 7. There's going to be a war in heaven, right? The devil and his angels will fight against Michael, the God, and his angels, right? And the devil and his angels are going to be cast out of the heavens to the earth, right? So God looks and he separates them out, right? And then, and then he begins doing crea you know, some other events, which I don't think are creative events until you get to day three, right? You have a creative event on day three, he did the earth and the heavens way back when, right? Look what it says in day two, and we will have to stop. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And the word firmament has the feeling that it's something solid, right? But it doesn't mean that. It means an expanse, and you'll see that. 
So God looks into the universe. There's day and night. Okay, he's God's, God's angels and Satan's angels. And guess what? God loves his children. He loves his angels. All right? And they are pro presently locked down in darkness. And in, basically, they're, they're suffering hell. You know, if you think about it, what is hell? It's a place where God's not. There is no light. There is no love. There, you know, it's utter darkness, right? There is no love, right? There is no comfort. There is no joy, because that's God. So his children, and so he's, that's why he's doing it quickly. He's got to get his children out of this problem, right? His angels, they're, they're his sons of God. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. It was so. And God called the firmament, capital H, what? Heaven. So this becomes this. He takes the waters and he divides them. He calls this heaven. That's what he does. So we have water here. Revelation talks about these seas, the, you know, the seas, you know, that there, you know, in the new heaven and new earth, there's no more seas. It's about that. It's not there's water, water on the earth. Goes on to say, anyways, and, and, and the morning, the evening and morning were the second day. So he creates this expanse here. The water is pushed away, all right, and separated, all right. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together under one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land capital, what? Earth, okay, capital Earth. So these lower waters, probably made them, put them too high. They're probably up here originally. He pushes them down lower, gathers them lower, and let the dry land appear. Wasn't it he created it then? Because he created it in the beginning. There was a judgment, and now you have the heaven and earth in the expanse. And then you're gonna find out, then he says, okay, you know, uh, if you, cosmology has, you know, the, you know, the Big Bang, a bunch of gas floating out there, it's, you know, sort of solidified together into a, a sun, and then other parts solidified into rocks that sort of floated around those suns called planets, right? Right, that's sort of, you know, there's a galaxies and stuff like that, co coalesced, right? Well, God said, no, he created the earth without the sun. In fact, in the original creation, there were no suns, right? Why, you know, why the sun? Well, the sun is light. Well, God's the Father is outside the universe. He needs to create light in the universe for his angels, his angels, to function. In the new heaven and new earth, is there any need for the sun? No, because God the Father is a the light thereof. He's here. You know, we, you know, these lights right here are artificial light. Guess what suns are? They're artificial light. They're not, they're, they're not, they're not needed, right? There's a bunch of rocks floating around there in the universe, planets. That's what God's done, created. But anyway, so God says here, let the dry land appear. And the gathering together the waters he called seas. And these are not seas on the earth. These are seas here. Lucifer is a what type of being? He's called Leviathan. Yeah, he's, a, he's a sea creature also, right? He, uh, he hangs out probably up there as well. So anyways, we'll start. We'll do more of that next time. I'll uh, go through a little more detail. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for your blessings, for your grace, and your love. Help us, Lord, to uh, see these things. Lord, help us understand why. The most important part is, Lord, that we understand that uh, you, uh, you kept it secret so that the Christ may go to the cross and take care of our sin, that we might uh, be redeemed from this present world, from the power of darkness, and be translated into the kingdom of your dear Son. We thank you all for your blessings and your love. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.